Hello and welcome back and that is right today we want to talk about the dull 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 subject of USB drives they are painfully necessary right well it doesn't matter which decade you've been in for the last 30 or 40 years USB storage drives are a thing but I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we said they're anything more than painfully necessary and there are some brands out there that are trying to challenge this releasing smaller USB drives bigger capacity USB drives, quieter USB drives. And of all, all of these that I've talked about on the channel for a very long time, one of the most intriguing examples is this one, the SK Hynix Beetle X31. It's called the Beetle because for some bizarre reason, they seem to think this drive looks like this Beetle, a little scarab. And I'll be straight with you, you know, let's get the disappointment out of the way. It definitely, definitely doesn't. This drive knocking around uh, 512 gigabytes and um, uh, one TB, knocking around for $69 and $89 respectively, is a champagne gold or rose gold USB drive that connects via USB type C and it's a USB 3.2 Gen 2 connection. 10 gigabit connectivity there. Now, this drive from them, this isn't their first external drive, but I would say it is their first kind of pretty carry around the back of your suitcase kind of a drive here that connects with Mac systems, Windows systems, and indeed, you can go ahead and connect it with your mobile phone if you choose just directly, bang, in there, you can access the content of this USB quite well. Now, what is it that SK Hynix are trying to bring to the table here with this USB that sets it apart from one of the, frankly, millions of drives out there in the market? Well, number one, it is an external SSD. That means that not only are you able to fully utilize the 10 gigabit or 1000 megabytes per second satura um, uh, bandwidth that the USB port connects with, but it's hardware architecture inside, SSD architecture inside with a controller and NAND on board allows it to sustain that performance for a greater length of time. There is a school of thought when it comes to external SSDs that when you are buying an SSD, much like this one that has an M.2 SSD inside with components on board, that that external connector there, that USB that you see on the bottom, ends up being something of a bottleneck because the internal components, SSDs, we know uh, from here on the channel many, many times that whenever we're talking about M2 NVMEs like these ones, that these SSDs in some cases can reach up to 3000 megabytes per second. The SSD and the NAND controller chip configuration inside this, I'll be straight with you, can definitely go more in terms of overall performance than that 1000 megs connection at the top can promote. The SSD controller inside, check in my notes there, is the Cephas 2 ACN T03A ARM 32-bit uh, controller. That is uh, a two-core controller as well, and that is combined with a single uh, module of 128-layer 1200 uh, 12, uh, megatransfers per second NAND. That's V6 NAND as well, 3D TLC. So that means... If you didn't have that USB on the top and you slammed that inside a Gen 3 M2 slot, you could probably achieve speeds of 2,000 megabytes, maybe 2,500 megabytes per second. But that architecture does also allow for that sustained performance mentioned. And for some users, peak performance is not as important as decent performance that is sustained. The sort of performance where you want to make sure that you're not looking for some high-end performance speed. What you want is a nice steady flow rather than high performance, which ends up ends up oversaturating the onboard controller or oversaturating uh, 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 memory. And therefore, suddenly your 3000 megabytes per second absolutely gutter balls down to 200 meg. For some users, Slow, steady wins the race and consistent. This is very much an example of that. Now, the bridge between that M2 NVMe inside and the USB connection is an AS Media ASM2364 USB bridge. Relatively common, I've seen it in some of the other uh, USB adapters we've seen on the market, but predominantly I've seen that controller in devices like this one. Devices where they are empty cases where you get your own SSD. And there is a school of thought, we're talking about this in another video, that when you buy an SSD like this and you have that bottleneck that can put things down to 1000 megs, and again remember it does support Thunderbolt and more, but you're never going to be able to exceed that 1000 megs. There is a school of thought that for that $89 that you're paying for this 1TB, you could go out and spend 40 to 50 pounds on a 1TB drive like this and stick a 1TB M2 NVMe in an external case that promotes 20 gigabits per second, 40 gigabits per second Thunderbolt there with USB 4 as well, 
There is an argument that maybe you may be better off doing it that way. There are USB Type 4 drives in the market like this one. This one here from Arico. This allows performance numbers of well over, well in excess of 3,000 megabytes per second because it has the M2 NVMe inside uh, a device that has a bridge controller there for type, uh, USB Type 4. However, this drive runs silly hot. It gets way too hot. And also, it oversaturates a great deal easier. And those are the very things that this drive is trying to avoid. Now, alongside all of that architecture, it's worth highlighting that the durability on this drive, thanks to that 1,000 megabytes per second, alongside uh, two meter drop protection, alongside a rather small but very sturdy stature, means that your data is gonna be pretty well protected not only with those sustained 1000 over 1000 megabytes per second performance numbers in terms of temperature but also when it's knocking around at the bottom of your bag or when you accidentally drop it on the ground now alongside that case i will also add that this system arrives with um, usb type c to type c and usb type c to type a cable but it also arrives with and i'm sorry sk hynix one of the ugliest cases i've ever seen for a usb drive I get, not not very long ago, I had a long conversation about um, iPhone cases with Eddie when we were talking about the protection of why so many users with iPhones have got cracked screens and why so many of those self-same iPhone users do not have cases on their iPhones. And I think the main argument is because the iPhone looks so pretty. Now, with that, we return to the SK Hynix drive here, which I think a lot of us can agree, although it doesn't look like a Beetle, seriously, SK Hynix, it doesn't. It is very easy on the eye. 7.4 centimeters by 4.6 centimeters by 1.4 centimeters. There's a nice little drive. But they also include this hideous case. And I think most users, myself included, and I protect everything you can see. I've got a big chunky foam uh, case there. I would still say that if I bought this drive, part of my reason for buying this drive would be based on aesthetics. And that case is ugly as all hell. There's going to be users that can use it. it. I just don't happen to be that. I like that they include it. I like that the USB cables are of a very sufficiently high quality as well. Very good quality there. But I think they would be lying to themselves if they thought anyone is actually going to use that rubber casing. But that's enough jibber-jabber. Let's head over to the test machine and put this USB drive through its paces and actually see if that sustained performance can actually live up to the rep. Benchmarking this drive is going to be ever so slightly different from other SSDs that we've reviewed on the channel. This is indeed an external USB SSD and although it has got that great performance there, if we move that down, of 1000 megabytes per second up and down, ultimately a gigabyte per second, it's worth remembering that that is because of that USB interface and almost certainly the NAND inside on that custom board, that little 2230 or 2242 uh, M2 NVMe inside this casing is probably capable of a little more more than that so this is going to act as something of a bottleneck not a big deal because let's face it if you're going to be using an external drive you're locked in on your external connections and unless you're going to be utilizing a thunderbolt port then you were never really going to get higher than this connection on a lot of modern pcs nonetheless i think there is something to be said against paying 134 dollars for one tb of ssd storage when right now for 1,000 megs, that's only twice that of a SATA SSD. That's quite a lot of money for a 1TB, and a lot of it is going to be paying towards the case, that little micro case, which is going to have to be heavily reliant on heat dissipation as well. So what I wanted to show you there on screen immediately was the temperature when we concluded the tests on this drive. It did go up the highest it got to. I believe it was 41 degrees. Re refresh it there. We'll perform some live tests as well uh, in just a moment. Ignore that one. That's the Seagate drive. You can see it's gone to 36. And we'll be putting it for a few more paces. Now, while it does, uh, before we start that, it's worth talk talking about the testing that we've performed thus far. Utilizing Crystal Disk. And again, connected to a USB Type-C Thunderbolt 4 port on this test rig. But of course, throttled down to USB 3.2 Gen 2. You're able to see that sequential performance at 1 gig. 4 gig, 16 gig, and a 64 gigabyte test file transferred to and from this system, we could see that we fully saturated that level of connection We're there with an average speed there of one gigabyte per second, with the IOPS being fairly respectable all the way through. IOPS is always something that's a little tougher to measure on an external USB drive because there is certain latency and friction issues to take into back, but nevertheless, these are some good numbers there, even on the mixed performance, but again, 
this is we are still talking about some NAND flash inside there that without the USB bottleneck could probably go higher than these numbers anyway. So moving away from those, if we go into something a little bit more thorough, we go into something like Atto Disk Benchmark. In Atto Disk Benchmark, I did a quarter of a gig, 256 megabyte test, and again, full saturation throughout. Same goes for the one gigabyte test file there, full saturation all the way through. Once again, just proving that the only thing keeping this drive down is that USB 3.2 Gen 2 connection. Now, what we're going to do is start by running AJA. AJA, we're going to run it here. We're going to go for a very dense 5K red test file there. We're going to go for a 1 gigabyte test file. We're going to make sure that we're selecting the E31, that X31 drive, I should say. And we're going to start that testing. We've done that quick test there. And as you can see, full saturation there. Not a huge surprise. And if we refresh uh, that temperature, it takes just a few seconds. We'll probably see that although the temperature was 36 earlier, if we look at it again, oh no, it's actually done very well to maintain that temperature. But what about if we go in? <coughs> Forgive me, a bit of a cough at the moment. We go for a continuous run, click OK, and this time we're just going to constantly bombard a read-write action on this drive while AJA continues to create, create, create that file over and over again. And what we're going to do is just now refresh that temperature there because almost certainly this drive is going to start hitting those highs. It's at 36. We'll refresh it in about 10 seconds time. But I'll be straight with you. I thought even after a brief period of one gigabyte test files, files over a one gigabyte external USB connection, even after 10 seconds of repeated use, I expected that temperature to already be in the 40s. Let's refresh again and see how that drive is cooking. Let's try it again. And we're up to 37. So the heat dissipation is doing a very good job here. Of course, again, sorry to be repetitious, that NAND is being throttled by the USB. So that NAND is not being given the opportunity to reach the dizzying heights of performance and therefore heat uh, generation and necessity dissipation. But still, nonetheless, with that test running over and over again, this temperature is still pretty respectable. We're going to do a third refresh there while we're looking at the temperatures. Flick down. And we're only up to 38 degrees. So again, quite pleased with this external drive being an SSD, being bombarded over and over again with that one gigabyte write and read and still hitting that. But why don't we go for something beefier? We're going to go for a 16 gig. This is going to take its sweet, sweet time while it's writing 16 gig. That's one gig per second for about 16 seconds or my you it's probably gonna hit about 17 in a bit uh, fully saturating that usb as you can see and once again this time when we refresh i will not be surprised if we hit that 41 degrees here we're just waiting for it to refresh drop down let's have a look and see how the nand is doing and no it has maintained that 38 degrees there again whether you thank the bottleneck or not, dissipation on that is still very, very good for that external SSD. And I would expect it to be as such. For a drive like this that's arriving out the gate with its 134 or 99 uh, MSRP price tag, it's not one of the newest drives in the market, but there is certainly a vogue for more compact SSDs in the market these days. And overall, I'd say for this testing, for what you're getting for the package, it may seem a little pricier than a lot of SSDs in the market there, but I do like the design on this. And I'll be straight with you. I'm more impressed right now with that temperature dissipation throughout the course of those tests. To put that into a bit of perspective, I've got a Gen 4 SSD sitting inside this system. Obviously, that Gen 4 SSD that's inside this system is on a Gen 4x4 lane, but that SSD isn't doing anything this ssd here which is a gen 4 ssd is doing nothing at all and it's still at 40 degrees so yes that external drive benefits from the external air but not that much because it's still resting on top of the pc in question and ultimately i think a lot of this comes down to a good amount of design on that chassis what do i wish this drive presented us with more i wish there was some client tools updating the firmware on it wasn't the most straightforward and although you can see the design they've been pretty slick all the way through i don't quite like the fact that the uh, client tools and installation of firmware was nowhere near as straightforward as something like a, a Samsung external drive. And the availability isn't quite as easy as that of some of the main players out there from WD and Seagate. But for what you're getting for this money and for the compact nature of the thing and don't look, you know, overlook a lot of those design uh, rigidity elements, I think this is a good 
drive. And as far as an external SSD goes, it delivers everything it says it can. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed today's review. Let me know in the comments if you have. We'll probably do a written review on this drive very, very soon. Uh, when we do, I will um, publish it there in the link in the description. And we'll do some more updated tests, perhaps. We'll run with PC Mark just for a little bit to run some applications from it and see how things go. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Use the free advice section, the Discord, the community r.nas compares forum, or the Ko-Fi and Patreon members club with expediated support and monthly Zoom calls you get to be on, as well as early access to all of the videos on the channel. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.